Hello, Internet, and welcome to uh, episode 52 of the Stanford MLSS seminar series. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm here uh, in person with Curran. Hey. Um, Piero, say hi. Hello. Uh, Fyodor. Hello. And uh, our guest today, Bilga um, from FAIR and Meta AI, or I guess it's just Meta now, no FAIR. Um, yeah. So uh, as usual, um, we'll have a 30 minute uh, a 30 minute talk followed by a 30 minute podcast style discussion um, where you, the, the live audience, can, can ask questions. A little bit about Bilga. So, Bilga is a research scientist at Meta AI. Um, she's interested in the intersection of energy efficient and sustainable system design for large scale machine learning. Um, she was awarded a ACM SIG HPC dissertation award, honorable mention. Um, more, more recently, I think one of her papers won a outstanding paper award at MLSIS. Um, so we're very excited to, to have her. Um, so, you know, go ahead, Bilga, take it away. Uh, go ahead and share your screen. And um, we're excited to hear your talk. Thank you so much for the introduction. Are you able to see my screen now? Looks good, okay. Um, yeah, so my name is Bilge and I'm a member of the SysML team at Meta AI. And I'll be talking about designing sustainable data centers today. So we'll first examine AI's growth from model, data and infrastructure perspectives. Then I'll talk about building environmentally sustainable data centers. And finally, how can we make AI part of the solution? So let's start with the big picture. Data center energy footprints are growing. And looking at the energy consumption of some of the biggest technology companies over the last years, we see that since 2016, the energy footprint of Microsoft and Google has grown about two times and Meta close to four times. Currently, DCs consume about 1% of the global energy demand and about 30 to 50% of the ICT's total footprint. And ICT energy consumption is projected to reach 7% by 2030. And a significant portion of this growth at Meta is driven by AI. AI models have grown thousands fold in the last decade and they're not near stopping. And largest models at Meta are deep learning recommendation and ranking models, DLRMs. Um, and they contain trillions of parameters, and they are larger than the models like switch transformers and GPT-3. And over 90% of the memory capacity de demand in DLRMs are coming from embedding tables. Embeddings are used to encode sparse and high dimensional inputs into dense vector representations. As the right figure shows, over time, such sparse features used in DLRMs increased 40 times. And size of each embedding table has also experienced a tenfold growth. So not only the model sizes, data being used to train the models has also grown. AI is among the most data intensive tasks at Meta. And data used for DLRMs has grown two times in the last two years. And as we improve training throughput, for example, through high performance training accelerators for AI, we see an increase in data ingestion bandwidth demand by as much as four times. And this is significant since it has motivated redesign of data ingestion pipelines specific for AI. And this growth is reflected in system capacity requirements as well. Both training and inference capacity has grown close to three times over the recent 18 months. And we can further break down the infrastructure usage by looking at the whole AI model development cycle holistically. And that shows 30% is spent on data storage and processing and 30% on training and about 40% on inference. So both training and inference contribute significant footprint. In the meantime, as system architects and researchers, 
we work on improving the efficiency and performance of these systems. However, this does, this does not actually reduce their energy footprint. This is due to Jevon's paradox, which suggests that efficiency also increases consumption. As we improve the systems and algorithms, they become more prevalent and overall usage increases. Now I have two examples. In our recent work, TTREC, we reduced the size of the embedding tables by 100 times with no accuracy degradation or time overhead. And ImageNet now requires 44 times less compute compared to seven years ago, from AlexNet to EfficientNet. However, these improvements did not reduce the overall energy. As we optimize existing systems, it enables newer and larger models and the iterative optimization cycle continues. As we see on the right, there is an overall 28% improvement in operational footprint for a model at Meta, enabled by things like domain-specific acceleration, utilization improvements like low precision and using resource-efficient models. But overall usage still increased by 18%. So efficiency is not going to reduce our footprint. We need to redesign or design our data centers with sustainability in mind. Considering the carbon footprint of the hardware from the start and at to end of its life cycle. And that starts from manufacturing, which starts from extraction of raw materials used in the hardware and then transport, use of the hardware, and finally recycling at the end of its use. And most of the existing research just focuses on product use. But we need holistic approaches, which considered, considers embodied and operational footprint. So next, we take a look at the breakdown of embodied and operational footprint of the models at Meta. And this chart is from our sustainable AI paper, which will be presented in the upcoming ML, MLSYS conference later this year, also tomorrow's system reading meeting at Stanford too. So as you can see, majority of the footprint is operational and data centers usually offset the operational part and can claim carbon free. And when you do that, embodied carbon you inherit when you buy the servers and the data center hardware becomes significant. And offsetting carbon for operational use is great, but it does not solve the problem in the long term. Because with carbon offsets, you purchase the renewable energy generated elsewhere, which may be generated at a different time of the day and used by someone else, while you continue to use and draw energy from the grid. So we need to learn to operate fully and directly on renewable energy. So I'm going to switch gears now a little bit and talk about the renewable energy characteristics and why this is an important problem. And I have the renewable energy growth projections on the left. Currently, the share of renewables in the US grid is only about 20%. EIA projects that it will grow to 42% in 2050 and 81% of the renewable energy will be solar and wind. On the right, you see California Grid's renewable energy generation from a selected week last year. And this is how an average renewable generation in a week in California looks like. And California Grid's has, California's grid has 32% share of renewables on the grid on average. And this is much higher than the US average. But the, due to the intermittent nature of solar and wind, there's high variability in energy generation, and that is as much as three times. So as renewables in the grid increases, we are going to see more fluctuations in energy generation. And this can cause excess or lack of supply at different times of the day. 
we need to learn how to deal with this variability in the long term. In fact, renewable fluctuations are already causing curtailment problems in California grid. And curtailment means the deliberate reduction in the output below from what could have been produced. Essentially, those resources are wasted. And this happens because of two reasons, transmission bottlenecks and oversupply. So since 2015, the curtailed renewable energy has grown steadily as wind and solar capacity has increased. Last year, 6% of the total generated renewable was curtailed. So how can we design data centers to operate on renewable energy at every hour given this variability? First, DC operators need to decide the solar and wind investment amount, which will generate a certain energy profile. And this may leave gaps in your renewable supply as shown in the figure here. Then we need to implement complementary solutions such as energy storage or computation shifting. And in order to operate on renewables at every hour in an optimal way. And the problem gets even more complicated as renewable energy characteristics vary from region to region and to season to season. Here we see three different regions with three separate characteristics. The first is Oregon, a majorly wind region. Second is North Carolina, a solar only region. And finally, Utah, a hybrid region. So the first column shows the hourly renewable generation average across a year. Second is the highest 10 days. And third is the lowest 10 days. So there could be days where the renewable energy generation is almost non-exist. And there could be days the output is double compared to an average day. And the last column shows the daily histogram of the energy generated in a year and how much variability there is within a year. And this further motivates the need for complementary solutions to renewable deployment. And in the second part of my talk, I'm going to present you a framework, Carbon Explorer, that we are actively working on building. And the goal of the framework is to help evaluate solutions to make data centers operate on renewable energy. And Carbon Explorer takes supply and demand data as inputs, evaluate potential solutions using this data, and produces the carbon optimal footprint curve as output. So as inputs to Carbon Explorer, we need fine-grained data on hourly DC power load and hourly renewable supply per region. As solutions, we evaluate different renewable deployment amounts, battery deployments in data centers, and carbon aware scheduling, which means shifting the workloads from times when the renewable energy is low to times when there's excess supply. And as output, Carbon Explorer will find the carbon optimal solution by taking into account both operational and embodied footprint. We will deep dive into each solution later, but first let's start with the inputs that we need. Meta has many data centers across the US as marked on the map. So next, here are the wind and solar farms Meta helped build, marked as green and yellow points on the map. If you notice, they're close to the grids where our data centers reside. Meta's investments usually matches the renewable profiles of the corresponding regions. But there are some DCs where there's only solar farms because the region is not suitable for wind generation, for example, the southwest regions, oh, southeast regions. And there are regions like Midwest where there's majorly wind energy. And there are some hybrid regions too, such as Texas and New Mexico. So we need to generate supply and demand profiles for each region. 
And here you see the map of US, US energy grid. And since 2019, EIA is releasing data on renewable energy generation in the US at hourly granularity. So we can map each of our DCs into this map and project the renewable supply data per DC. Next input we need is the hourly DC power demand. Data centers exhibit daily load fluctuations. Top right plot shows that the CPU utilization of Google and metadata centers varies at different hours of the day. And on average, the savings are about 15 to 20%. On the right bottom, we model the relationship between utilization and power, and that daily 20% utilization swing corresponds to 5% swings daily on average. So data centers consume more power during the daytime, but the fluctuations are not nearly as significant compared to the renewable fluctuations. And Carbon Explorer uses this hourly power load of data centers as an input to the framework. Next, let's deep dive into the solutions. First, we need to determine the optimal renewable investment amount for each of our data centers. So as the deployments increase, the hourly renewable coverage increases, but the manufacturing cost footprint coming from building the farms itself also increases. And there's also the issue of excess supply. So these charts show the renewable coverage, which means the percentage of time the data center is operated on renewables at different solar and wind capacities. And this is shown for three of Meta's data centers in, in Oregon, uh, North Carolina, and Utah. And the intersection of the black lines below show the current megawatt renewable investment amounts of Meta. So as you increase the deployments, you get diminishing returns in terms of renewable coverage or operational footprint. In fact, if you reach, if you try to reach 100% hourly renewable coverage, there is a long tail to get there using only renewables. To see the full length of the tail, here we see a flattened version of the previous flat, plot with some of the wind and solar power shown as total renewable capacity on the x-axis. And the tail is the longest for Oregon because there are significant number of days with very low wind power. With solar only regions like North Carolina, the highest renewable coverage you can get is around 50%. And for hybrid regions like Utah, the tail is the shortest since solar and wind has complementary generation profiles. So the tails we discussed here are to mitigate the operational footprint, but there's also the embodied footprint, the cost of building the wind and solar farms. And later we'll see how Carbon Explorer helps determine the optimal investment amount by taking into account both. Next solution we included in Carbon Explorer is battery deployment. And with rapid improvements in lithium ion batteries in the past decades, they become cost effective and can be used as a common storage for renewable energy. And we use a simple data center side battery deployment model where batteries are charged when there's excess renewable supply and they are discharged when there's lack of supply. And with better deployment, your hourly renewable coverage increases, but there's additional carbon cost coming from the manufacturing the batteries. And another downside is that batteries create waste at the end of their life. And the heavy metals and flammable materials it contains can cause health risks if not properly recycled. And Carbon Explorer analyzes how much battery capacity you would need 
for different renewable investment amounts. So the values in the grid shows the battery capacity in terms of hours a data center would need to operate on fully renewable energy. For example, in our data center, if you invest in 500 megawatt of solar and 200 megawatt of wind, you would need three hours of battery storage to be fully renewable. And there are also some cases where there's not en enough excess supply to charge your batteries. And we mark them as infeasible points on the grid. Next solution we implemented in Carbon Explorer is carbon aware scheduling. With carbon aware scheduling, you shift or delay the workloads and data centers from times where there's lack of renewable supply to times with excess supply. Figure here shows an illustration of our algorithm where you have a maximum allowed capacity and a flexible workload ratio. Within these constraints, you shift the workloads from times when carbon intensity is high to times when it's low. As this requires workload flexibility, AI training workloads are great candidates as majority of them happen offline and are long running jobs. And even for AI inference, the inference computation may be pre-computed to be served at a later time. And for Google, Borg traces show that about 40% of the workloads in Borg have flexibility to complete within a day. So within the workload flexibility constraints, Carbon Explorer evaluates how much additional capacity you would need to reach 100% renewable coverage through scheduling. And the value in the grid shows the server capacity in terms of megawatts that will be required for each renewable capacity. Now we need to put together all the solutions and also include the embodied footprint of the hardware in the picture. When calculating the embodied footprint of the hardware, we take into account their lifetime. For example, servers last about five years and batteries last about 10 years, assuming we use one charge and discharge cycle per day. And we also include carbon costs coming from recycling as well. So let's start with the renewable only solution and look at both operational and embodied footprint in this chart, chart with the North Carolina data center as an example. And as you increase the renewable deployments, your embodied footprint grows and your operational footprint reduces. And since this is a solar only region, the operational footprint cannot reduce lower than 50%. Next, we add batteries into the picture. Batteries can remove the operational footprint completely with the cost of increased embodied footprint. Finally, we add carbon aware scheduling on top of renewables. Scheduling also helps reduce the operational footprint, but since it's limited by workload flexibility, it cannot remove the operational footprint completely in the data center. And we assume 40% workload flexibility here. And its embodied footprint is higher compared to the battery solution too. And we can draw a Pareto curve to find the optimal solution among the design points. And overall, in all cases, embodied carbon cost that comes with it works the investment since the operational footprint reduction is significant. And ultimately, the goal of Carbon Explorer is to minimize the sum of embodied and operational footprint. So let's take a look at now how the, the carbon optimal points in all of our data centers across the US. So the hash parts of the bars show the embodied footprint and the solid portion of the bars show the operational footprint. So existence of a solid portion in the bar 
means the optimal solution was not to reach 100% coverage. And in fact, with the renewable only solution, the renewable coverage of the carbon optimal solution ranges from 53 to 99% for different regions, not 100%. Next, we add battery on top of renewables. With this solution, the solid, bar, solid portion of the bars are completely disappeared. And that means the most carbon optimal way to deploy batteries is to deploy enough battery capacity to remove the operational footprint completely. And batteries enable an order of magnitude or more reduction in total footprint. Finally, renewables and carbon aware scheduling provides a competitive strategy to achieve carbon reduction too. In fact, most of the wind only and hybrid regions, um, carbon aware scheduling is more effective than the battery solution. And the additional required server capacity to allow for scheduling is in the range of one to 11% for these regions. On the other hand, for solar only regions, since scheduling is limited by the degree of workload flexibility and relies on additional server capacities, scheduling alone is not enough to sufficient, is not sufficient enough to reach 100% renewable coverage. And this is also the case for regions like Oregon, where the wind generation is not as consistent compared to with other regions. So overall, this is the approach we use in Carbon Explorer to evaluate potential solutions to complement renewables. And going forward, uh, we would like to include a combined battery and carbon aware scheduling and more realistic battery models. And I've shown you the steps we need to have a holistic approach. And you also saw a practical examples of using Carbon Explorer with our data centers as case studies. Uh, we published Carbon Explorer on archive this week. You can check it out if you are interested in learning more. And we are also working on open sourcing the code too. And we would like to enable more solutions and better models to be plugged in and evaluated using this framework. So feel free to reach out if you are interested in collaborating. And I would like to conclude my talk with a discussion on how can we make AI part of the solution. Some areas we investigate are using AI for prediction and forecasting of renewable energy generation patterns, and AI to model and discover new catalysts for energy storage, and reinforcement learning to make scheduling and battery charge discharge decisions. And finally, we need to characterize the degree, degree of delay tolerance of AI training and inference, meaning how often we need to retrain the models served in production, and could we pre-compute the inference values to optimize for carbon. Um, with that, I would like to take a moment to thank my collaborators in this work and conclude my talk. It will be a pleasure to answer your questions. And I'll keep the slide on how can we make AI part of the solution up to spark ideas. Awesome, thanks so much, Vilga. Uh, that was a great talk. and. Uh... Um, I think we had some questions in the YouTube chat. Um, so a quick reminder to folks on YouTube, please send in your questions and we'll um, get those across and, uh, and get, the, get those discussed. Um, so I guess to kick things off, um, yeah, I guess I was curious, like you talked a little bit about um, training workloads being kind of more flexible in some sense, like you can actually um, schedule them uh, you know, you know, if you're running a job at night, you, you can, you know, kind of move it and, and schedule it in the day. There's some flexibility there. Uh, but I'm curious, like, um, you know, what your thoughts are on, on other types of workloads. I think in your talk, you also mentioned things like um, inference workloads, for example, and, and especially with large model, I, I think like uh, the workload there uh, starts to increase. And, and I'm curious if you've looked at that in terms of its impact um, on, on the CO2 
uh, emissions there. And and yeah, so I guess that was my first question. I have a few a few others, but yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So for AI training, as I showed in one of the earlier slides, majority of the training is happens offline. And there's also a portion of training that happens all online, meaning you deploy the model, and as the new data comes, it continuously trained. But the majority actually happens when people with experiment with these models and different parameters. Um, so that's and these are long running jobs. So that that some of them takes days to train. So you could imagine a scenario where you checkpoint the training, training and then restart it. Then there is um, renewable. Uh, then is in, enough renewable energy. Um, so for inference, I think it gets more interesting. Um, you could pre-compute the values ahead of time, but that might come with uh, perhaps an accuracy um, accuracy trade-off um, when deployed in production. But in general, I feel like we need to think in the data center which components from the data center workloads we can extract and compute ahead of time um, that we don't commonly think think as flexible, but perhaps a part of the system can be redesigned to make to allow for such flexibility. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it seems like it's pretty interesting the interaction between these different different types of workloads. And like you said, maybe there's an opportunity to kind of uh, pre-compute some of these things. Um, but yeah, as you said, accuracy trade-offs, which might be interesting to explore. I think one of the things I'm was super curious about was, um, you know, like the uh, the tool that you built. Um, it's it's obviously like pretty. Uh, uh, comprehensive in some sense, like it looks at uh, all these different regions and kind of um, tries to map out what, what you know, options you have in terms of managing uh, data center um, carbon emissions. Like, I guess one, one thing I was curious about was, have you tried to sort of um, deploy some of these ideas or is that something that's in the pipelines? Uh, so for example, like uh, a lot of the stuff that you uh, mentioned in, in, uh, towards the end of the talk seemed to suggest that scheduling actually in some regions could be uh, pretty impactful. Um, and, and also like, um, it seems like there's also maybe an opportunity like to maybe balance workloads across regions because some of the regions, you know, have like much higher um, uh, operate, like much lower operational costs during like, for example, the solar regions you were talking about. So I'm just curious, you know, what, what kind of the thought process is there and what, what might be coming next there? Yeah, the, I, I think scheduling definitely has a uh, great potential in helping um, helping uh, helping reduce the carbon footprint. And currently, this is at the research prototype level. Carbon Explorer is at the research prototype level um, um, for uh, geographical shifting. You mentioned that is certainly a really interesting aspect that. Uh, we would like to uh, we would like to investigate as well. Uh, with geographical shifting, things get uh, slightly more complicated than time shifting because then you may need to move the data across. And um, let's say you want to follow the world, follow the sun around the world, and shift from continents. Uh, in theory, that sounds great, but um, there are rules like GDPR, which which does not allow you to take the data out of a specific country. Um, so you may not continue to do do training that and the, um, copying the data back and forth could create actually a significant overhead too. But I think for less data intensive tasks. Um, that is uh, certainly a good option to do. But again, you would need the additional server capacity to allow for doing that. And you would need to take into account that too. Yeah, no, that, that is actually a great answer. I mean, I, I, I did not think about the implications of moving data across uh, borders there, but, uh, but yeah, no, it seems like, yeah, it was, it seems like it was very comprehensive in terms of you know the the thought that went into this work. So uh, yeah, really, that was really the goal. That. that was the goal. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks.
maybe if I can add to this, you know, maybe there are some tasks that are more prone to that, like maybe inference tasks more than training tasks could be like easier to follow the sun with the with the inference tasks and then the than the training tasks maybe um, i actually have another question related to the to the framework itself because i'm very curious so again i, I really like the, the fact that it is holistic and takes account all, all of these possibilities in particular in the first half of the talk i was thinking about well what about batteries and what about scheduling uh, different things <laughs> times so i said oh yeah exactly that's what you described <laughs> in the second half of the talk it's amazing um, one, one more question that i have about it is is um, how generic or flexible is it to different and potential future profiles? Uh, and with that, I mean, maybe next year, there's going to be a next generation of batteries that has a that have a different profile, both in terms of the, their carbon implications. Maybe they are created with different materials that are less uh, problematic materials, let's mm -hmm. say, or maybe they have more capacity and whatever else, right? And also, you know, maybe there's a new generation of solar panels or generation of turbines that makes it so that the, those profiles change. Uh, can that directly be integrated in the framework, uh, like like for a configuration, or is like one has mm -hmm. to work it right and really mm -hmm. about that? That's a great question. So currently, we are uh, working on making the framework um, flexible to include the configurations such as manufacturing for footprint could be a configuration that you could play with. Um, for the battery charging model, we actually use a very simplistic model currently, but um, certainly the, like where you charge when you have excess supply and discharge when you have um, not when you don't have enough supply. But I think um, that is one area we could improve and we would like to make the framework E easy so that different uh, models can be plugged in. Now, that sounds great because if you do something like that, then you have also the advantage of maybe potentially being able to have counterfactuals and think about, oh, what if I invest in this kind of new batteries versus these other kind of new batteries? Which one are the best ones that should mm -hmm. be next, right? Something like yep. that. Sounds super, yep. super compelling. Yep. One of the questions that uh, I was thinking about a little bit um, throughout your talk, Bogo, which, you know, great talk, re really interesting stuff. Um, and actually kind of inspired by one of the questions that one of our students was thinking about in the audience um, is what role do you think policy kind of plays in all of this? Um, because uh, there's, you know, when you're building a data center or, you know, uh, running models, um, what are kind of the incentives that you have to start thinking about in terms of, um, uh, getting people to kind of adapt to adapt policies like this and, and really focus on um, sustainable, uh, like kind of sustainable data centers. Do you think there's a policy angle or do you think um, maybe there's a way for the, the, the community to kind of police itself? Um, let me clarify the question a little bit. So policy angle, do you mean that um, like the governments should. Uh, yeah, yeah. So is there a role for government to play um, or some sort of like carbon sharing, something or another? There are, um, you know, I think it's, you know, at least in DC, they're, they're thinking about things like that. So do you think uh, that, what role do you think that plays in, um, in, the, in the solution space? Mm, so the, so the governments can certainly like incentivize um, or to help the solar and wind farms to be built. But it seems currently the technologies company is actually doing this voluntarily um, since mm -hmm. there is not enough act action coming from the government. This is my just observation and the renewable energy um, as I mentioned, renewable energy percentage in the U.S. grid is only about 20%, whereas you see these um, large technology companies going ahead and deploying all these renewable farms um, and um, be net zero. Um, I think government certainly can be play a more active role. I think, uh, well, that's all I can say. So does it seem like more the case right now that everybody kind of wants to be like carbon neutral, net zero, but there are technical challenges? Um, or do you think there are like actors or, you know, uh, institutions that um, maybe uh, want to do it, but, but don't have the technical capability? 
from from what i can see it's like the largest of the larger technology companies are doing this voluntarily and i don't see actually a much technical challenges of why not doing that mm. um, we also had a question <laughs> Yeah, we also had a question in the audience um, about Meta's. I think that they they announced a new research uh, like super super computing cluster. Um, do you have thoughts on how that will change kind of projected energy cons consumption uh, in the coming year or, or coming years? Yeah, I, I think Meta is fast growing, as I showed earlier. I think that's probably going to continue, but it, in the absolute terms. As you might have noticed, it's actually much smaller compared with the other bigger companies, um, but the growth is certainly there. But the a a AI research uh, supercomputer is really exciting, um, and it's going to be one of the largest supercomputers in the world, I think, when it's fully built, um, exceeding over five um, exaflops, I believe. So I'm looking forward what kind of interesting AI um, project it will enable. Yeah, cool stuff to look forward to. Bilga, just, just a comment on the Dan's question about incentives. I think the nice thing about some of these renewable technologies is that they've become cheap enough that cost is now a nice incentive, right? And one of the reasons you see companies actually go towards renewables is because in some places, it is the cheaper option. Now, the problem we're running into is that it's a cheaper option up to a point, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a cheaper option until you hit that 50% renewable mark. And then for every dollar you spend in, in extra renewables to kind of make for, for, for every kind of trailing percentage point, um, it's not currently cost effective, right? So it's nice that it's getting us at least part of the way there. And I think that trend will continue, right? Solar is continuously getting cheaper. It's astounding. Um, I wanted to also come back to this question of deferrable load, right? So you said Google mentioned something like 40% of their work, uh, workload is deferrable. How does that look like from the, you know, the engineer's perspective, right? The people that are responsible for deploying jobs on their cluster, do they have a mechanism or do we need a mechanism for specifying that like, hey, this workload is like deferrable or I need it done by the end of the day? Um, or is that currently something that's you know doesn't really exist yet? It it does exist certainly in the workloads you can um, in the batch workloads for example commonly you specify you would like to run this job in a daily cadence for example there are recurring jobs that needs to land every day and it doesn't matter what time of the day it will happen and it can um, it, there are different um, it's it, 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 not daily, but the, there are different um, SLAs like one hour, four hour and uh, daily. And actually people who submit the jobs like specify that. Okay, so it seems like the tools are sort of in place for people to start taking advantage of this flexibility. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. great to hear. Um, I, I wanted to ask, you know, I think uh, Piero was talking a little bit about this um, in terms of, you know, future tech and so on. But but I was uh, maybe, you know, a similar question, but in a different way. Um, I guess, like, um, it's a pretty thorough analysis, which means there's a lot of, you know, underlying variables, I guess, in terms of um, uh, how to extrapolate, um, uh, you know, like to... Uh, what happens, you know, when, when, you, when you have like batteries deployed and so on, like Piero said, like there's these counterfactual questions that um, sort of try, you're trying to answer. Um, and, and so like, I, I was just curious if you kind of um, explored, uh, I, I would say like the sensitivity of the analysis to some of these variables, to, in some sense to understand if like the solutions that you find uh, to these problems are like somewhat stable in some way um so that like you know if if you know the battery you know like you said like you assume like batteries are charged and discharged once a day so what happens you know if it's twice a day or like uh you know battery failure happens so on like there's a lot of these kind of uh variables that might might be different and change and, and so it, i'm just curious like how, how does that change kind of you know the the conclusions that you might arrive at um at the end of that analysis that's a great question 
um, yeah, the battery footprints can change or the server footprints can change. We use, for example, uh, um, a simple estimate of HP, one of the HP servers, um, CPU servers, carbon footprint that is published in HP's sustainability report as a proxy to uh, meta servers. Um, and if we play with that, and this also does not take into account like the um, other hardware components and data center you might need uh, when you allow for scheduling, or when you want to increase your peak capacity, it's not only the servers you increase, there's the other um, hardware you would also need to increase. Um, so, um, so these are definitely things that can be configured and um, played. We haven't done that yet. So currently uh, we are at the, just the, at at, at this stage where we um, uh, we are setting up the framework and but I think uh, with configuring playing with these parameters could give really interesting insights in the future. Yeah, I was just thinking like it's it's a sort of like designing a plane, you know, like there's uh, I, I think I was recently playing around with this yeah. software that uh, helps you you know figure out how uh, the height at which a plane can fly and so on. It's kind of like that. You change something and then everything yeah. kind of, uh, might change in the in the background. So no, but super super sure. fascinating. Yeah. Yep. Actually, it's slightly related and it's a little bit more of a generic question. It is not specific to your work, but it's something that I'm curious about to like educate myself. And I'm very curious about how these estimations of the carbon footprint of the different parts that you were discussing, the operational one and the, uh, the other one, um, are actually obtained and how actually reliable are those in general. Uh, also because it seems to me that uh, in many, and, and if there's something that we are leaving on the table too, because you know, your, your framework is super comprehensive and holistic at the same time, Every single time that I've seen people talking about holistic something, there's always something that they leave on the table that someone else will say, oh, ours is holistic because we consider also this aspect that was not taken into consideration by the previous work, right? Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. can comment mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, so how we obtained the embodied footprint or numbers is taken from the prior work. Uh, we found the embodied footprint of batteries and take into account their uh, lifetime based on charge discharge cycles. And for server footprints, like I mentioned, we take into account the HPE's numbers um, that are published in terms of carbon footprint. Similarly, we rely on the past work, but I agree these parameters um, can change the dynamics quite significantly as the technology improves. Um, so, but if we make the framework configurable and flexible so that we could, uh, so that everyone could um, go ahead and play with these parameters, uh, that is the ultimate goal. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds perfect. Really looking forward to that. I wanted to point out a, an interesting question that I saw in the YouTube chat, uh, which was uh, in some cases, uh, they, they're, they're, this person is wondering so if when renewable energy, especially things like solar, um, are there any cases where switching to the renewable energy would actually uh, induce some extra cost in, in energy cooling? So the example that they're giving is, um, is it ever the case that you switch to, for example, solar, and then you have to consume more energy and cooling? Um, are there any kind of interesting trade-offs there or things that you wouldn't expect to see at, at the first level that you have to start taking into account in, in your uh, in your tools? So let, let me see if I understand the question clearly. So when you switch to solar, you spend more energy on cooling the surface? Uh, I think I think that was that that was how the, the question is phrased, but maybe it might not be that um, you know, that, that particular example, but I, we're curious, um, are, are there any kind of unexpected consequences of, uh, of, of switching um, between different parts of the grid um, that might not kind of be obvious kind of at, at, at first glance? Mm, I, I, if the question doesn't make sense uh, off the bat, you can also say that. We, we're certainly not experts in renewables. 
Yeah, the, 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 it didn't. I, I didn't quite understand the question. Is 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 it the maybe during daytime solar is available and that somehow increases the cooling requirements? Just happened to be. I think those, that was the premise. Is it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, but did, I mean that will have that will happen regardless of the. Um, you use renewable or not right. so i guess the question is not really clear to me sorry right. one way i guess we can think about that is if we wanted to build a data center where it's sunnier to take advantage of solar is that going to increase you know our cooling costs down the road maybe from mm. that perspective mm, similarly even for batteries if you add a battery right and you start charging and discharging it a lot it actually requires some cooling especially if it's a big one with the kind you need for a data center so there's all these little things that I think, you know, in some sense, the question is pointing out that there, there can be some unintuitive kind of uh, little gotchas when you start thinking about introducing these new technologies. I see that that is really true. So, and in that sense, actually the wind, the places where there's wind energy available looks much superior compared with solar only regions. Um, but what do you do now? Like we already have data centers built in solar only regions. You can't just like abandon those and um, move to places where there's wind. Underground. Underground <laughs> data centers. Yeah. <laughs> They're on the ocean, right? People ocean, have been thinking about yeah. this stuff. <laughs> True. I will say, I think one of the questions that, that you answered uh, was the right one because the, 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 the viewer posted yes um, at some point. Uh, another question just came in from the audience uh, in terms of how we how researchers should be kind of allocating their time and resources. So do you think efficiency needs to be actively promoted as an area of interest? Um, uh, the, there, there's an extra, extra question. Do you think this is kind of the next logical step once people have had kind of their fill of accuracy? Yeah, I, I think efficiency definitely helps improve the technology. I just, during my PhD, I worked on improving energy efficiency of data centers. And, but I was maybe mistakenly thinking that this is also helping the sustainability of the world, but it actually enables the technology to improve. I think that's probably a better way to look at it. Um, it does not inherently make the data centers um, sustainable because of the Jevons paradox. And if you look at the history, you see many examples to this too, where you like you the efficiency of the cars has increased, but now many more people are using cars um, or driving cars. So the overall energy usage of the cars is not going to reduce because you improve the energy efficiency. So, but I think you're definitely helping enabling the technology to improve and which is a good thing. I, I also had a, uh, maybe a, a, a pretty random question, but I was just curious if you, um, you know, if you had some, uh, uh, a choice of like what data you would like to get access to in order to maybe uh, better answer some of these questions. As you said, a lot of the data that you had to uh, use maybe was public data or so on. So I'm just curious if uh, you know there's some data collection that's that's missing out there um, that people should pay attention to that might help um, you know not just Meta but other companies as well if they're doing similar analyses and so on. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of like renewable uh, energy generation well, supply data is really interesting. The EIA actually very recently started releasing this data um, on an hourly basis, but it is not available um, in the rest of the world uh, like the US. So that was one of the reasons the, our study focused on only US data centers, you might have noticed, but Meta actually has data centers across the world, but simply that hourly data is not available across the world. Um, I think that, that that is one crucial step that um, countries um, can um, take. Um, um, what else? Yeah, I, I think that's that that's probably was the most crucial uh, part. Um, and I think like, how do you go from like the 
uh, energy, renewable energy generation amount to the carbon intensity of the grid, I think there is some conversion needs to happen in between too. So like, um, I think that that also we used uh, we use some approximation of the carbon intensity of the wind generation itself. So, but I think EIA is actually planning to release the carbon intensity of the grid um, directly in the future too. So I think uh, that is going to help with this kind of research in the future too. That's no, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it, it's it's great that uh, they're putting out this data now. It seems like it's a big uh, catalyst for this kind of research. So, mm -hmm. um, super excited yeah. to see what you do with that data. <laughs> yeah, ho hopefully, like when we release the framework, um, it, it will help people to um, like analyze that data easier too. Yeah, I know we're at time, but if I can try to squeeze a little question that actually may require some time to be answered, to be honest, but maybe just a little glimpse into, the, into this would be interesting. What about the economic aspect there, right? You show that, that a really nice Pareto frontier and, you know, where, where's the kind of optimal point in that Pareto frontier? But obviously, you know, decisions from companies are made also based on the economic aspect. So do you think that that Pareto frontier is really distant from what the Pareto frontier will be if you consider the economic mm -hmm. aspect or what is the gap there, right? Um, so we did a very simplistic cost analysis and, and this is also um, what we see in other areas. The embodied carbon costs seem to correlate with the cost uh, quite well. So um, in that sense, what I can say is the relative uh, relative cost is you could compare compare relative cost of the embodied embodied carbon footprint cost. You can think relatively will be similar to the um, dollar cost, um, but the prices change in the future, and um, it's uh, in, in the future, and that depends on completely different dynamics. So. Um, we didn't analyze that in much in detail. Got it. But if, if the you know cheapest option is also the most energy efficient, it's 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 good for everybody. So that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. True. Cool. So with that, uh, I think we're at time. So first, I want to say thank you, Bilga, for for a great talk and a, and a great um, great great Q and A. It's been really really fun. Thanks to the audience as well for for sending those questions. Um, they they were really interesting. Um, so as usual, you can go on our website, mlsys.sanford.edu to check out our schedule, subscribe to our mailing list, see everything that's coming up. Uh, we only send emails twice a week. I've been told that in the past, I've said twice a day. It's only twice a week, I promise. Um, and, uh, you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit that bell icon to get notified when we go live. Uh, next week, we have Cody Coleman. He's going to be talking about uh, data selection for data-centric AI, data quality over quantity. So that seems really fun, really exciting. I uh, hope to see you there. Uh, with that, we're going to wave goodbye to YouTube. And at some point, the stream is going to end. Yeah. I don't quite